All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. Special time here for us for Three Up, Three Down. As we mentioned last Friday, we had our normal episode, but we forgot to hit the record button, or at least I did. Uh, so here we are in a special episode. Good to see some uh, new faces and some faces, obviously, that um, uh, are here yet again here for the second repeat, I guess you could say, or the double play uh, of things here for us today. Now, the episode on Friday and in this episode as well, they all will cover the same thing. So we'll be here with our four umpire system for us again today. Today's topic in the four umpire system is the basic response responsibilities of each umpire there. Uh, so we'll talk about areas of responsibility, we'll talk about fair foul coverage, uh, and we'll also talk about retouches and, and taking a look at tag-ups. Tag-ups and retouches are the same thing uh, in rotation. So that's our scope and our focus here today, all in this larger season here in the month of June of diving into really deep the uh, four umpire system here on the 60-foot diamond. So it's good to have uh, some familiar faces and then some even new ones join us uh, here for us today. I've got a couple announcements here and things like that um, for us here. Uh, it, we'll continue to use the chat, those of you guys that are here for like the first time. Uh, if you have any questions as we go through things, go ahead and drop them in the chat. DJ and Seth are always monitoring the chat, so they'll take a look at that one um, and answer any questions maybe directly. And then when we pause, we'll also bring up some of the more valid questions. Like, well, not more valid questions, but the more substantial questions uh, that need to come back to. Uh, we'll, we'll do that as we pause in different intervals. So just use the chat to go ahead and ask any questions, and we'll make sure we get those answered. Um, and then there's a couple different resources that we've been diving and, and giving out to everybody each Friday. Um, so those will be linked in the chat. DJ will do that here for us. Uh, the first of which is the focal points for 2021. Uh, we released a follow-up video on the wedge progression and then steel plays at home plate earlier this week. Uh, that was kind of the fourth part of our focal points here in the uh, season for 2021. Uh, and remember, as we kind of work those regular season games, especially as those regular season games kind of come to an end, continue to build those habits. So making sure we are aware of those focal points and, and, and thinking about them as we hit the diamond, uh, a really good thing for us to do. So we released that one earlier on here. DJ, I'll go ahead and drop that one in the chat. A couple other resources here, especially as we start to shift from regular season play to tournament play, one of which is the tournament rules of interest that was put together by the folks out West. Uh, Gary Groutman, Mark Bernstein, and many other individuals out there put this one together, the tournament rules of interest, basically just compare some of the regular season rules to some of the newer or lesser known things that are uh, given to us in tournament play. Also a really good resource for us to use to brush up uh, as we get ready for tournament play to revisit some of those rules. Many of you guys will probably lead some of your district uh, meetings with managers and coaches. That's another really good resource to go in terms of looking for what exactly to cover. Uh, so the tournament rules of interest from the West are also linked for us in the chat. And then lastly, this week, uh, Little League updated their FAQ to the mandatory play question. That was sent to, an, to us all in an email on Thursday, June 10th. Uh, but that FAQ link is also for us there in the chat uh, from, from Little League International to clear up on um, the things about mandatory play that have obviously been involved and needed some clarification from the rules committee. So all those uh, resources are out there and available for us, all then really uh, trying to get us to move from regular season play now to to tournament season play as all that stuff goes ahead and wraps up throughout June and then really starts towards the back end here as well. Uh, before I get going uh, with anything else here for us, anybody have any questions or uh, DJ Seth or anyone else, any other announcements here before we get started? All good on my end. All right, DJ's giving me the thumbs up here too. All right, and now, as I mentioned here today, our main focus for us to take a look at things here for us today, again, uh, is to go ahead and take a look at the four umpire system. Now, specifically, it's the basic responsibilities, and we'll do that uh, in three categories, one of which will be areas of responsibility for catch, no catch. Seth will take us through that. DJ will come on then and take us through fair foul coverage and some pointers there with that as well. We've got clips for both of those. And then lastly, I'll kind of wrap things up here with retouches or tag-ups, how exactly we're going to cover those tag-ups and retouches when we're in rotations, tag or retouches, I should say, they are the same term. So that is our scope of focus here for us as we get ready to get started here today. But before we go ahead and dive into all that new stuff, uh, I do want to take a brief second to go ahead and review things for us from last week. And if you remember last week here, our topic of focus was the basic rotation. So I'm going to start here tonight with a review of the basic rotations, and then we'll get into those general responsibilities of area responsibilities for catch, no catch, uh, and fair foul. And then ultimately we'll take a look then and wrap up with retouches or tag ups. Let's first start then with the basic review uh, of the rotations here. We started, um, if you remember last week, with covering two different types of rotations that are used here for the 60-foot uh, diamond in our four umpire system. We talked about the full rotation, and that was one of the two rotations that we'll use. Now, we call it the full rotation because every single umpire in the diamond, all four, is going to be responsible for moving in this individual rotation. 
Now, when do we use it? Well, we use it anytime there is no runners in scoring position. That's what that abbreviation stands for in our ISP. So we're going to use this rotation, the full rotation, anytime there's no runners in scoring position and U2 or U3 leaves to cover catch, no catch. Now, I've got a, a video here for us to go ahead and take a look at the basic movements. But before we go ahead and take a look at this video to review the basic movements, essentially what will happen here is that either U2 or U3, uh, whichever does not leave, they will be responsible for covering second base. Um, you, the plate umpire will be responsible for moving up to third base. And then ultimately, U1 will observe the batter runner's touch or R1 at first base. They'll hold on to responsibilities there and then release to point a plate and cover things uh, there. So if we take a look here at the clip uh, here over on the right, very easy for us to go ahead and see. Now, this is on the 90-foot diamond, but the rotation is the same. This is the full rotation used with no runners in scoring position anytime U2 or U3 leaves. Now, we'll see a fly ball here that is going to threaten the fence. It's actually a home run to left center. We can see the ball flying out to left uh, center field. U2, as you take a look at him, he is chasing the ball, so he is out, which means then this is going to put us into full rotation because there's no runners in scoring position. If we take a look at U3, U3 is uh, busting on in. His goal is to arrive to second base before the runner. Uh, remember, because our responsibilities are singular here in this rotation, we can be a little bit closer to second base. We talked about toes on the cutout here, right on that grass line of the cutout at second base. That's a good spot for U2. And then as we also mentioned here with, with U2 out, and now U3 covering second base with his toes or her toes uh, at the uh, cutout there. The plate umpire is going to move in foul territory down the line, be there for third base, be there for anything that happens at third base. Uh, and then ultimately we're going to see, uh, as you see here, the first base umpire observe the batter runner's touch at first base and then head on down to cover the plate. So uh, this is a home run and a very clear example here of the basic movements, the basic rotations of each umpire. U2's out, U3 covers second base. Plate umpire moves up in foul territory to cover third, and then the uh, first base umpire takes a look at the touch and then releases to the plate to point a plate through foul territory. And as you see here, he's responsible then, U1 is, for any plays at the plate, or in this case, the touch uh, of the uh, batter runner on the home run at home plate. A couple reminders, remember, if two umpires do happen to break on the same fly ball, remember when we're deferring to U2, U2's our quarterback, so that means that our wing umpires will break off his or her pursuit, and then they'll go ahead and either rotate, as we see in this clip, or move to point of base, which is a concept we'll cover a little bit later here uh, as well. Uh, remember that we also want to make sure in this full rotation that we're rotating aggressively with the intent to arrive there before the runner. We saw U3 do that at second base. The plate umpire do that as he rotated up to third base. And then U1 observes the batter runner touch before moving to home plate. So that was our full rotation. Now, the other rotation that we also tend to go ahead and use in this four umpire system here on the 60-foot diamond is the fill rotation. And the fill rotation is going to be used then in one of three situations. And we'll talk about it here in just a second. But we call it the fill rotation because we only use one umpire to cover any situation here that may come up due to a vacancy created uh, when an umpire leaves to cover catch, no catch. Uh, so the basic movements here, as I mentioned, are dictated by one of three situations one of which may be when U1 leaves to cover catch, no catch. And if I go ahead and get ready to diagram, if we take a look here at U1, we see him or her go ahead and chase a fly ball to the outfield. And that means then that U2 is going to be responsible for pivoting into the working area. And remember, we want to be a little bit deeper here in this working area. And by deeper, we mean closer to the mound because now U2 is responsible for everything at first and second base. So again, very clear as to why this should be called the fill rotation. U1 leaves, U2 then picks up, and then U2 then picks up or fills the vacancy created by U1 and is responsible for plays at first and second base. So this fill rotation then is used anytime U1 leaves. Now we're also going to see it used situa situationally in a couple other different situations. So uh, if we take a look when we have runners in scoring position and U2 leaves, or if we have runners in scoring position and U3 leaves, we're going to see the same situation happen as well. So just as we talked about with U1 out, uh, with runners in scoring position, let's say that U2 decides to go ahead and leave. Similarly, U3 will come in, again, deep into the working area. Remember, because he is now or she is now responsible for plays at both second and third base. And then very similarly, with runners in scoring position, if U2 or U3 leaves, Remember that we're going to go ahead and rotate on in, uh, and in this case, take that deeper look here in the working area, allow the ball to take us to the play. And remember, we want a little bit more depth in the fill rotation because our responsibilities are multiple, whereas in the full rotation, we can be closer to the base because our responsibilities are singular. Nonetheless, both the fill rotation, used anytime U1 leaves or we have runners in scoring position and U2 and U3 leaves, 
And then the full rotation, which is used anytime there's no runners in scoring position in U2 or U3 leagues, those are the two basic rotations then that make up things here for us on the 60-foot diamond in the four umpire system. DJ Seth, anything else to add there? Any questions here before we get ready to go ahead and move on uh, into some newer stuff here for us today? Nothing in the chat. All good here. All righty. Well, again, today's uh, focus here for the most part is to take a look at the basic responsibilities here uh, of us in the four umpire system. And we're going to specifically start with areas of responsibility, which takes a look at coverage for catch, no catch, both on the infield and in the outfield. Then we'll take a look at fair foul and then finish up with retouches. So, Seth, I'm going to give it all over to you for areas of responsibility for catch, no catch. All right. So for the catch, no catch, um, we're going to actually relinquish some responsibility to the plate umpire now in this four umpire system. Um, and essentially what the plate umpire is going to have is they're going to have all catch, no catch in the infield. And they're going to take routine balls in the outfield. And we'll talk about what routine means here in a second. Um, so if you don't have a runner in scoring position, this is as the plate umpire. If you have no runners in scoring position, uh, we want to clear F2 like we normally would, but then we're actually going to chase towards where that fly ball is going. And then once we have our, our catch or no catch uh, signal made, call, whatever, we're going to come aggressive and we're going to get back to point of plate. And we're going to retreat and we're going to get in position for a potential play at the plate. Um, and then with the runner in scoring position, uh, we're basically just going to limit our movement to the dirt circle. We don't want to get on the grass or, or get outside of that dirt circle, uh, mainly because, again, we have runner in scoring position. So we're going to have somebody coming to the plate potentially. So we need to make sure we're in position for that. The only exception here is if a base umpire uh, moves out to chase a trouble ball. And again, we'll talk about the difference between routine and trouble here in a second. Um, the umpire that goes out is going to uh, assume all fair foul and catch no catch decisions on that ball. Um, so if, for instance, if U3 leaves, U3 is going to have fair foul down the line. He's also going to have no catch, catch no catch down the line. And then our umpires are going to rotate um, accordingly based on that. Uh, so then we can move on to areas of responsibility. Um, when we have uh, an umpire leaving. So we talked about the plane umpire. They've got all routine uh, catch, no catch in the outfield and all catch, no catch in the infield. Uh, so now we're looking at U1's responsibility and that's highlighted over here on the right side in the white. They're going to have um, any trouble ball that takes the right fielder towards the right field line. Um, anything that comes straight in or straight out with the right fielder or moves towards center field, that's going to be U2. Um, U2 is going to have the center fielder uh, basically anywhere the center fielder goes. And then anything that brings F7 uh, straight in, straight back or towards the center fielder, uh, U2 is going to pick up that. And that's the areas you see here in red. And then finally, U3 is going to take anything that would take F7 towards the foul line. And that's that area in blue there. Um, and our big mantra here is uh, we know U2 is the captain of this. So if two umpires do decide to go out and chase uh, the same ball, the crew is always going to defer to U2 on that, um, whether U2 is right or wrong. Uh, we're just going to defer to U2. So let's talk about what constitutes um, some routines and trouble balls. So a routine ball is really anything that it's a pop fly that a an outfielder can camp under, or it's going to be something that's basically going to be a for sure base hit or um, potentially an extra base hit if it's a gap or anything that is not going to require extraordinary effort to actually make a play on. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side of that, what a trouble ball is going to be, it's going to have something that requires a fielder to take or extraordinary effort. So anything that's going to make that fielder uh, maybe a catch on the run or a dive, anything that's going to make them actually work to try to get that ball uh, to retire the, the batter, we're going to consider that a trouble ball. Anything that has two com fielders converging, is automatically going to be a trouble ball. Um, what I don't want you to confuse this with is the center fielder takes two steps and camps under it, and the right fielder's coming over to back them up like they normally would. Uh, we're looking for a ball that's going to be between two fielders, and they're going to have to communicate to each other who's going to take that ball. Um, anything that threatens a boundary, so we're talking the outfield fence, we're talking the foul line, or we're talking a sideline fence, um, anything that's going to threaten one of those boundary lines, we want to go out on and make sure we're, we're, we're seeing that. And then I, I covered the last part here. Anything that's within 20 feet of the foul line, we're going to go ahead and go out just to make sure that we've got a good fair foul decision on it. Um, that's pretty much it as far as, as routines and troubles. Um, so again, routine, anything that is, is a can of corn or it's a sure base hit gapper, trouble balls, anything that requires extraordinary effort, converging fielders, or it's going to threaten a foul line or a boundary. Those are the ones we want to chase as base umpires. 
any of those routine balls, again, going to belong to the plate umpire in the new system. And I think Stu's got some clips here for us. Yep, definitely have some clips. And, and Seth, you were, you were getting ready to uh, kind of recap everything. You said it. Remember, routine, everything on the left here of the screen, that's everything that belongs to the plate umpire. Remember, the plate umpire also has all fly balls on the infield. The plate umpire has all fly balls on the infield, whether they are routine or treble. So in the infield, uh, the plate umpire has both routine and treble balls. However, in the outfield, the plate umpire only has the routine balls the trouble balls in each of those four categories that Seth went ahead and outlined, those all then uh, are going to allow our uh, base umpires to go ahead and go out on. Now, one of the questions that we had on Friday was, you know, how conservative or how, you know, how do we read these? Uh, and we want to encourage umpires to kind of err on the side of being more aggressive on going out on these. So, you know, if you're, you know, you too, and you chase a couple routine balls, I don't think there's anything that, that, that there, that we should be worried about with that. Um, so if you are questioning whether or not you should go out on it, probably err on the side of being aggressive on going out on fly balls, whether or not it's routine or trouble, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you go out, then that is the base umpires and the plate umpire will obviously just kind of hang out. He won't necessarily take or she won't necessarily take that call. So if the umpire's out and they read trouble, uh, then we go ahead and, and allow then that base umpire to be the, the, the ruler uh, essentially on that individual play. Yeah, it's it's kind, of of, oh, yeah it's kind of replacing the old – the the if the if it's in the air you're there mantra with the win in doubt go out mantra mm -hmm. um sort of two mantras that were floating around but we're definitely adopting a win in doubt go out here yeah. something in the chat real quick Stu. i've heard catch below the waist is a specific type of trouble ball here covered by extraordinary effort probably thoughts on uh catch below the waist as being trouble versus routine yeah, I would absolutely label that as a trouble ball. Um, so, yeah, you can definitely go on that one. I would say extraordinary effort on that. Lord knows what happens with, with little leaguers and going out that one. That's a great question. Catch below the waist, uh, definitely a trouble ball as well. Cool. Good. A couple clips here. I'm going to just let them run here, and, and we'll, we'll talk through them here. Remember, you've got each of these four categories here. here the, here's the first category, extraordinary effort. So here's our one below the waist, obviously coming hard and in. Uh, umpire gets as far out as he possibly can here uh, and then should get set. We'll talk about tracking and chasing a little bit more so next week. But nonetheless, that's obviously a trouble ball. Here again, if we take a look at the left fielder, he's charging in. Another catch or attempted catch below the waist. This is extraordinary effort. This labels then ourselves as a trouble ball. U2 is out, as we see demonstrated in the clip. Second category, as Seth mentioned, was a ball, a batted ball that's basically going to require two fielders to converge. Uh, so here we see both the shortstop and the second baseman. This ball's right between them. Uh, so we should be out on that one. We'll talk about tweeners here in a little bit later today and give us some strategies there. Another example of this trouble ball with two or more fielders converging, this time in the outfield as this other clip comes up. Here's one to right center. As we see, we've got two fielders that are converging on this one. Uh, could have probably looked at routine. This is why, as Seth said, uh, when in doubt, go out. This is another reason why we probably should be out on this fly ball. But two or more fielders converging as the second category. Third category, Greg, I saw you on the call. I think this is your World Series here. This is the one that uh, threatens um, the, uh, the fence or any other boundary. Uh, Seth mentioned the home run fence, so this one's a home run to left center. We should have an umpire out on this one. Should be you too. And then the next clip is we've got a catch basically on that warning track, so to speak. Another one that threatens the boundary. Now, Seth made this point. The boundary is not only our home run fence, but it's also down the line. Uh, so if we get something down the line, we want to be there as well. Some of you guys have probably heard the term bracketing a foul ball. Uh, anytime we bracket the foul ball, both umpires, like the wing umpire and the plate umpire, will go with it. We'll ask that the plate umpire kind of hold the line, so to speak. And that just basically means that the plate umpire, if that ball drifts back towards the line, the plate umpire would be responsible for being on the inside, so to speak, uh, to take the foul line there if that ball drifts back, that foul pop-up. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So again, trouble ball, ball that threatens the fence, either a home run or on the side. And remember, if we've also got a boundary that's got like a tarp or something like that too, uh, we probably also need to be down on that one as well. But again, threatening the boundary is our third category here. Here's another one. Kind of think about this one. This one goes into foul territory. As we mentioned, we can also have a boundary in foul territory, especially if you kind of uh, have an imagination and think that there's a tarp over there. We definitely need to be down on that way uh, as well. Last one is one that's within 20 feet of the boundary. Remember, when we give track and chase, we want to get our chin over the line. DJ will talk more about that one here in just a second. Uh, but we want to get as far as we can. But again, uh, with the ball within 20 feet of the line, that's a trouble ball we should be out on. Uh, and here we have one down at the first baseline. Same deal. We want to get our belt buckle on the line or our chin over the line uh, and be, ready, be able to go ahead and render that fair foul decision. 
Now that gives us a pretty good look at some trouble balls and areas of responsibility. Another topic here in terms of responsibility is fair foul coverage. So DJ, fair foul coverage is all yours. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> fair foul, we're going to start with the plate umpire um, and responsibilities and who has what. So uh, the fair foul plate umpire is going to have it up to uh, the front edge of the base. Um, uh, I use the, the, the analogy of putting a pane of glass on the front edge of the base. If, if a ball is going to touch, shatter, break, crack, anything uh, with that pane of glass, that ball, uh, that fair foul call is now going to go onto our, our wing umpire, U1 or U3. So uh, the, the fair foul belongs to the plate umpire. Uh, we'd be looking for a, for a signal um, five, five or so feet off of the line, usually uh, to, the, to the cutout on the infield side in fair territory, um, and maybe a few feet beyond the, um, the, the runner's lane uh, there in foul territory. We need to be getting on and up the line as much as possible, holding that line. Um, getting ourselves centered on the line, ready to rock and roll. Some would say belt buckle on the line um, to be able to uh, uh, adjudicate the, the fair foul uh, call there. Um, any batted ball that obviously stops uh, front and, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> any batted ball that st stops in front, uh, again, that's going to be the plate umpire fielded um, or touched or anything like that, fielded in front. If we got a ball bounding beyond the bag, uh, we, we need to let that one go and let the wing umpires have that. Um, if, uh, if U1 or U3 uh, leaves the line for whatever case may be, we want to afford them an opportunity to, to get back to the line to make a call. Um, but we want to make sure that um, if they do abandon a line and abandon the call, it will fall back onto that plate umpire. So make sure, you know, we're using good uh, visual communication, nonverbal cues and stuff like that to communicate with one another. Um, so as the as we uh, again, uh, the, if a foul ball uh, or if, a, if an umpire does abandon the line, that's going to go towards a plate umpire. We want to make sure that uh, we're, we're getting our chin and we're staying uh, focused and centered over that line to make sure uh, we have fair or foul um, and we're we're holding that line. We talked Stu just talked about bracketing foul fly balls as well, uh, making sure that we are uh, using getting more sets of eyes onto the onto that call um, as much as possible. Uh, when we're talking about U1 and U3, uh, again, the fair, uh, the fair foul call uh, comes as soon as we get to the front edge of the base. So again, if we got that pane of glass, if we're going to crack or shatter that glass, uh, it's going to be, it's going to fall on the U1 or U3. Uh, again, we want to make sure that we're, we're getting everything we can uh, to get our, to get our head and eyes over, uh, over the line uh, to make an accurate call. Um, uh, we want to make sure, obviously, we're, we're keeping our body in foul territory as much as possible. We don't want to be involved in any sort of, of hairiness when it comes to a play or anything like that. We want to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to get our camera uh, right over the line there. Uh, if you if you do abandon, if you are the fair, uh, if you are the U1 or U3 and you abandon the line, as we just talked about, um, uh, don't come back. Uh, don't come back. If you're, if you're, if you take a step off the line and then come back, that's one thing we're talking about completely abandoning uh, the play. Um, so just to, to create, uh, to clear up any, any fuzziness there, there's a difference between abandoning the line and then taking a step off the line. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. Um, if you're, if you're going to uh, uh, peel out and, and abandon a play, uh, by all means, mm -hmm. stay out fair foul. will will um, will stay with the plate umpire there. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, if we do the, the a typical time we would abandon a play is going to be a, is going to be that pop fly, that can of corn right behind first base, typically right where we're standing. Usually um, the, the best way to, to kind of handle that situation is to stay put, read the fielders and then make your movement at, at, at allowing your fielders of the, the freedom of their movement uh, to, to make that play. So um, try not to get uh, too, too, uh, too excited or too animated, allow, allow the, allow yourself those that extra second or two to read your second baseman and read your first baseman and, and, and how they're crashing and then respond and react um, after that. Yeah, perfect. Um, DJ's main point here, just as we get these fair foul coverages in and take a look at chin over the line, uh, camera over the line basically is what he used. And then again, this is all based upon proper use of eyes, not only to watch the ball obviously down the line, but also then as we'll see in some of the clips here in just a second, 
to make sure that we are working with our partner um, in, and we're working in unison so we, that we can avoid two umpires making either the same call or two umpires obviously making a different call. Uh, so that's some things here to go ahead and think about as well. A couple of clips here to go ahead and emphasize a lot of the concepts and bring light to some of the things that DJ uh, went ahead and shared with us. Remember, plate umpire is responsible for any um, ground ball or any ball that stops short of or is fielded in front of the base. So here the third baseman fields it in front of the base. This should belong to the plate umpire. Remember, we should see the plate umpire with his or her chin over the line. We take a look at this clip right down at the bottom. Uh, we see uh, Jordan Leslie's our plate umpire. He's got his chin over the line right there, uh, and he's pointing fair. DJ made that mention that if that ball is kind of within like five through ten, five, seven, ten feet of the line, we probably want to go ahead and have a, a signal, and that's exactly what we see happen here. So a good fundamental here, ball fielded in front of third base. Uh, or in front of the base belongs then to the plate umpire. Now, DJ also mentioned the pane of glass. Uh, this was actually in the LSU Tennessee Super Regional from last night. Uh, so I was watching this one and pulled this clip here for us. This one is kind of right in that area of, uh, you know, right on it. Remember, DJ mentioned that this pane of glass goes from the front edge of the base and like on up to the sky. And if it breaks that as this fielder fields it kind of even with the base, then it belongs then to the base umpire. In this case, it's U3. Now, U3, he's got both feet in foul territory. He should have his head over the foul line as he does. He's going to go ahead and point fair, and then, you know, the play goes ahead and continues. So, again, if it's fielded in front of the base or stops short of the base, it belongs to the plate umpire. But if it breaks that pane of glass, as we see here, even very slightly, it belongs then to the wing umpire. In this case, it was U3. Another example of this one, breaking the pane of glass. This one's a little bit more obvious. Obviously, it breaks it here. It's fielded behind. Uh, we see a good friend in Little League here. That's Brian DeBrower. He's actually working, I think, right now in the South Florida, Texas game. Um, he is going to go ahead and point fair on this one. We'll see his footwork and things like that here in just a second on the replay. You see him start here in his position. And then he does that whole thing that DJ talked about. He's going to get his chin or his camera over the line here. Falls within that five to seven feet range. Target distance over the line. Points fair and then handles it accordingly. But again, it's fielded beyond the base, so it belongs then to the base umpire. A couple examples of Little League umpires doing that one here. This one's fielded beyond the base. Good job here by the uh, first base umpire. Again, we want to take as many plays in fair territory as we possibly can. We'll cover that with you one a little bit later in the series. Uh, but nonetheless, great job to get his camera lens over the line and then get in position for the call at first base. Now, the last kind of area here for us to talk about uh, in, in terms of the ball bounding to make sure that we have this teamwork then uh, is the one that really then is going to obviously clear a fielder and go down the line as well. Here again, this base umpire does a really good job. Both feet are in foul territory. Some people may want you to straddle it. Some people want you in foul territory. Some people don't care either way. Uh, but nonetheless here, as long as our chin is over the line, that's exactly what we want. Uh, but again, this one is, is down the line. Uh, you'll see that this umpire does not give chase to this ball. A lot of times people will for whatever reason decide to chase this ball down the line uh, now if you had a tarp or out of play or a rickety fence down on the sideline like I could I could give you the idea of going out and chasing this one but again for the most part we can just go ahead and turn and look at this one and hold on to responsibilities uh, at the base and this is then moving to point of base with chest to ball and more often than not if we've got a fence or something like that where it may go out of play then obviously we're going to catch on to that now, obviously, if there's not a fence down that line and we've got kind of an imaginary line for out of play, we do probably want to at least chase that one if the ball and the nature of the play looks like it's going to bound towards like the boundary itself. So, again, that goes back into that trouble ball, so to speak. So if it's a fair ball down the line and it's going to threaten the boundary in terms of, you know, getting caught in a, into a tarp or potentially going out of play down a fence line or something like that, we can chase that one. But for the most part here, these bounding balls beyond the base, there's really no need to chase them. Rather, we would see you rather see you do what this umpire does that's the point fair and then go ahead and move to point of base and get chest the ball for any ensuing action back on the play and that's exactly what we see develop here replay i'll show you again what exactly this looks like umpire's done a really good job here you can see both feet in foul territory chin over the line balls down here gives our signal here in that five to seven range that foot range that dj talks about within the line we point fair and then move to point of bag here for any ensuing action at third base. And that's what we want to see. And again, if you've got any potential, you know, out of play stuff, you know, you can you can chase it. But for the most part, we would rather you have have you at point of bag for any ensuing action. Uh, and you can go chest the ball and get any uh, out of play stuff there. 
Again, these couple of looks at our umpires doing essentially the exact same thing. Both feet in foul territory. Chin was over the line here. No need to chase this one here because it's going to be fielded very cleanly. Not going to threaten the boundary. We move to point of plate or point of base. Same thing here on this one. Again, this one kind of bounds towards the fence. So if you can kind of think if that fence wasn't there, so to speak, you may have to go chase that one. Uh, if you were working with like an open field, for example, uh, but for the most part with a tight fence and things of that nature, we can get out of plays and balls bouncing around there from right here as we see this umpire point of bag, chest to ball will allow us to see that, especially on the 60 foot diamond. DJ Seth, anything, um, Anything so far here on those to, to point out or, or readdress? Nope, good on mine. All right. Now we've covered bounding balls, obviously the ones stopping or fielded in front of the base belong to the plate umpire. Those that break that pane of glass like we've seen in the most recent clips belong to the wing umpire. If we get one in the air, this is one that we want to travel or go out with. Remember, this is exactly what Seth was talking about in terms of a trouble ball. It's within 20 feet of the line. Good job here by this umpire. Uses the stop hand to communicate to you two that he has the ball. So he's going to go out and track and chase that one. Gets as far as the play allows him. Gets set. Um, we should probably see him a little bit closer. Remember, we want chin over the line. So chin over the line is the goal here, just in case this one's right on the line. So we want to be right on the line. Uh, but we get set, point fair, and then go ahead and make your call. Another really good one here uh, in terms of abandoning the line. This is exactly what DJ talked about. If we take a look at U1, I know it's fuzzy here right now, but if we pick up U1, this is what abandoning looks like. Uh, this is basically just getting the absolute heck out of the way. And remember, in this instance, we're going to give this fair foul decision and the catch. The catch and the fair foul decision then will both belong to the plate umpire. So anytime, and this is real important, anytime we have a ball along the line, even though it may belong to the base umpire initially, the plate umpire has also got to hold the line. And that way, if we get into a situation with abandonment, as we do here, that plate umpire is already in position to make that fair foul and the catch no catch decision. So again, even though we have U1 and U3 and they're going to be out and take those for the most part, the plate umpire still should be either first baseline extended or up the line or third baseline extended and up the line for the fair foul, depending on what the case may be. That way, not necessarily that we have two eyes on it, but that way we are in position in case we get abandoned. Now let's take a look here at U1's fundamentals. Again, let's take a look at U1. This is abandoning. He's sprinting hard off the line. DJ mentioned here that to abandon, you know, the first thing to realize is that the ball's on top of you, right in the space that you have at pre-pitch. Uh, and then the first thing that you want to do is read the fielders. And that's why he said stop. The whole idea of pause, read, react all comes into play. Read the fielders. Now, this umpire goes and sprints into fair territory. We would probably rather see you try and work to point of base because you're still going to be responsible for plays at first base. So as we abandon, yes, the tendency is to get off of that one. And, you know, you may have a force play at first base and you have to move to, to uh, the A position for that one here, if that's the case. Uh, but nonetheless here, we would rather you see you go ahead and move to point of bag in this instance to before, or I'm sorry, after you go ahead and clear uh, the, the, the fielder. So obviously provide them with freedom of movement and then vacate here or bail or, or abandon the line as we see, say here, abandon the line more so towards point of base because you're going to be responsible then for all ensuing plays at your base there. Now there's obviously a difference between doing what this umpire did in that clip sprinting off the line and you know as I mentioned we would rather see that umpire move more so to point of base for clarity's sake and then doing this, and DJ mentioned this one. This umpire kind of hops off the line here, so to speak. Now, we want to hold on the line as much as we can. We want chin over the line. And, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that would argue if you can't get your chin on the line, it probably shouldn't be your fair foul. And there's some merit to that. Uh, but nonetheless here, this umpire uh, tries to jump off the line so the bounding ball doesn't come and get him. Uh, but again, if we can kind of get in foul territory in this case with chin over the line and then kind of open up with this one, that's the ideal situation here. Uh, so if you talk, take a look at the slide before this one or the clip before this one, that was the umpire moving aggressively off the line. This is one that we kind of jump off the line. We just need to make sure here that both umpires work together. Now, DJ made this point too. If we kind of do one of these numbers as this third base umpire does, the plate umpire should give U3 a chance to come back to the line and then make his or, fair, his or her fair foul call. Because the situation we want to avoid is two umpires making the call. Now, luckily, both umpires are pointing fair here in this case. Uh, but again, plate umpire, we want to give him at least a split second, get our eyes. This is proper use of eyes. Not only on the ball for fair foul, 
but also then on our partners so that we don't get two calls here. Now, luckily, as I mentioned, no harm, no foul, because both umpires are pointing in the same direction uh, for fair foul. Uh, but like I said here, for the most part, if we have to hop off the line and we can't get chin on the line, uh, then we kind of need to be more clear here with our plate umpire. Uh, and if we're going to abandon that line and it's not going to be our call and this umpire hops off, remember, move to point of bag. That'll be the nonverbal moving to point of bag that you are giving that one to the plate umpire. But if that base umpire moves back to the line, as we see here, then the um, plate umpire just has to give that umpire a chance, that wing umpire a chance to make the fair foul. But again, ideally, we want your chin over the line. And in situations where you cannot get chin over the line, we should probably go ahead and give that one back to the plate umpire and consider that to be abandonment and then move then to point of bag. Another example of this working out, again, good teamwork here. The discipline by the plate umpire is excellent. Uh, U3 in this case, we want to see him chin over the line. You can take a look at where he's at. He's a little bit further off the line than we would otherwise want him. Remember, we want it's okay to have two feet in foul territory. You can straddle it if you want, but we want your chin over the line, regardless if you're straddling it or two feet in foul. Uh, but great job here. Great patience by the plate umpire. He's got his chin on the line. He's not straddling it, but he's got his chin on the line here to see fair foul very clearly. Good teamwork, good use of eyes by the plate umpire. Obviously, this one bounces beyond the base. But again, we want to see our uh, U3 here in this instance get closer to the line. If he's going to take this fair foul decision, he should have chin over line, step back to the line, and then go ahead and make his or her fair foul decision. Okay. We wouldn't want to see a, an umpire make a call here. In this case, it's in the grass. We want to make sure that we have uh, a proximity to the line, that we are either chin over the line uh, or in some instances straddling the line as well. And again, that's all based upon proper use of eyes. BJ, Seth, anything there on teamwork here before we touch on tweeners? Nope. Don't be afraid to communicate, guys. If you guys aren't sure of who needs to take it, just do the classic, you know, stare down, pat your chest maybe, say, hey, I got this one, and then make the call. The last one's kind of a more tougher concept and definitely one that we'll dive deeper into when we get into things uh, on next week, next Friday. Uh, these are what I call tweeners. Now, a tweener is what other people may call bloopers. So tweeners and bloopers, uh, same thing. It's one of those fly balls that's probably going to come down somewhere in the vicinity of the like grass line between the infield dirt and the start of the outfield grass. So for the most part, these are situations where we'll have the outfielders charging in very hard and the, out and the infielders charging uh, back pretty hard. So we have converging fielders. Uh, and it's a situation here, and many of us have probably saw this in the Women's College World Series last week, that when we have balls that are tweeners, it's really hard to read your partner, number one. And secondly, if your partner goes out, it's really hard to rotate and get to the next base in time. So I want to give us a strategy here at how to use these tweeners. It's something that I'll introduce today and definitely come back and explain a little bit more thoroughly next week when we talk about tracking and chasing fly balls. Now, the principle that I'm going to propose is that you can do both. So we're in this kind of this gray area, I guess you could say, of these tweeners uh, from your initial starting position. Remember, it's fair foul, so we still want to get our chin over the line uh, for fair foul decisions. But at the same time, we're going to do both. We're going to, from our initial starting position, Position, turn with it, get our chest over the, over the line, get our belt buckle over the line, get our chin over the line, and, and render our fair foul decision. But what we're going to use is a standing scissors stance, and I'll show that to us more so next week. I think we'll see a clip of it here in just a second, and then go and move back to point of bag. So the, the challenge here with these tweeners is from your initial starting position, get your belt buckle on the line, get your chin over the line, do your fair foul catch, no catch responsibilities, because those are our priorities. And then once you handle fair foul, Catch no catch, move back to point of bag here. And again, that standing scissor stance, which we'll see demonstrated either this week or next, communicates to your partners that you have both the fair foul and catch no catch, as well as then uh, all ensuing plays at the base, which means then here, as you see at the bottom of the screen, there's no chase and therefore no need to rotate. Here's an example of one of those tweeners down the line. Okay. Again, this umpire, remember, we want to get our chin over the line. He's almost there, but we should see chin over the line. Again, this one kind of drops in that vicinity. But as we know here, this fielder is not going to catch the ball. Uh, and we don't necessarily want to go out on this one either because, you know, doing so may make it tough for you too in the fill rotation to get to third base, especially if it's a force out. So we can do both from our initial starting position to swing. We should swing around with it. We should get our uh, chin over the line, point fair. And then just as this umpire does, move back to point of base for any ensuing action at third base. Okay. So again, from that initial starting position, get on the line, get your chin over the line, and then move back to point of base once it drops. Again, that's some of the strategy that we want to use for these tweeners. Another example here of one of these tweeners, 
right here it is. And this is kind of what I'm talking about. It's not necessarily going to be fielded, but we know it's going to be within 20 feet of the line. So it is trouble ball technically, but again, it's going to drop right in that area, right behind uh, the infielders and right and in, in, in substantially in front of the outfielders. Uh, here we want to go ahead and point fair, uh, but we don't necessarily want to give chase to it because again, if we get a play back on the batter runner here at first base, who's got that call? So again, on these tweeners in that gray area, right behind the uh, the the where the out, where the infield dirt meets the outfield grass, you know that gray area, we want to encourage individuals to do both. So from the standing scissors position, and that's something that we'll definitely uh, highlight and give examples of next week. We want to get our chin over the line. Take a look at catch no catch. There's no need to go ahead and chase after this one as well, because again, we want to make sure on these tweeners because there's not enough time on the 60 foot diamond for your partners to rotate. That means then that you can help them out by doing both. Number one, from your initial starting position, spinning around, getting chin over the line for fair foul and catch no catch. And then secondly, moving back to point of base. That way, we don't have umpires trying to get to a base uh, in a foot race with a 12-year-old or an 11-year-old or whatever the case may be on a 60-foot diamond. All right. I think that about covers everything for tweeners, fair foul. And again, tweeners and fair fouls and things like that, those will all be things that we'll take a look at next week when we meet again on Friday. I'd uh, take a look then at uh, the difference um, uh, in tracking and chasing fly balls here on the 60 foot diamond. DJ Seth, anybody else uh, questions wise or anything like that to address here before we go ahead and wrap things up tonight? Yeah, I had a uh, uh, four man double header last night. Um, we utilized some of these. Um, uh, well, not some of these. We utilize the new, the new four-man uh, uh, responsibilities and rotations. Um, a great point that a partner, District Six um, <clears throat> umpire uh, Don Mason, brought up is pre-pitch, know where your fielders are. Um, and I thought it was a was a good point in, in acknowledging um, whether or not how trouble or how routine a ball, a batted ball might be. Um, and I felt like it was worth sharing. So pre-pitch, just give a take a look around and see where your outfielders are, um, just to uh, to acknowledge, you know, how much how much effort might need to be put into a fly ball. Oh, well, that's a great point. I've got nothing else to add. Yeah, and, and you know that's a great segue, DJ, into next week when we talk about tracking and chasing fly balls, and you know that concept about knowing where your fielders are. That way, you can be more apt to accurately determine, uh, you know, what may be trouble and what may not. And then, as Seth mentioned here too, that mantra: "When in doubt, go out." That's something here that we can kind of think about. Now, that doesn't mean we just chase happily, but again, when we pause, read, react, and do our due diligence, and we're not sure, when in doubt, go out. Those are a couple of main points here. I definitely take away from things tonight. Now. A, Again, uh, I think that a lot of the stuff that we've covered last week and then this week are really the meat and potatoes of your pregame conference. So uh, some of those things to definitely take a look at and cover with your pregame, uh, with your crew in a four umpire system on the 60 foot diamond. Obviously, the rotations that we covered last week, the fill in the full, and then basic areas of responsibility, as we mentioned as well. One last thing that I forgot to go ahead and mention was retouch responsibilities um, as well. I kind of got ahead of myself there. So let me go back to uh, sharing my screen uh, with us here real quick so that we can take a look at those here real quick. Uh, but again, and those retouch responsibilities are just as important as everything else in touching in touching base here with uh, our, our crews. When we talk about retouching, we're talking about tag ups. And again, we kind of went over this last week, but the guiding principle is here. When we are in rotation, tag ups will advance the umpire position at the base ahead of the runner, position at the base ahead of the runner. Now, this will be for when like an umpire leaves and vacates to cover catch, no catch or in situations that may require an umpire to vacate to rotate. So for example, let's say we had bases loaded and U2 leaves to cover a catch, no catch. Uh, U3 would move in and take the tag up at uh, second base because U3 is the umpire ahead of, of, of R2. But that base here, third base, we're not going to ask um, the, the third base umpire to do both, the tag up at second and the tag up uh, at third with U2 out. So we're going to advance that one as well back to the plate umpire. So in rotation, anytime an umpire has to vacate, either to chase the fly ball as U2 did in my example, or rotate as U3 did in my example, that tag up then or that retouch is going to go to the umpire position ahead of the runner. I've got a couple examples here that I'll go ahead and clarify that one here in just a second. The only exception as we see here is R1 only in a full rotation. Remember R1 and the batter runner are both the responsibilities of U1 in the full rotation. He or she has to take responsibility of that, of that runner first and then go ahead and rotate to the plate and basically beat either R1 we're the batter runner there. So uh, with R1 only in the full rotation, U1 still has R1's, uh, U1 still has uh, R1's tag up or retouch there. A couple situations or examples just to go ahead and bring light to this one. R2, R3 with one out. Let's say U3 leaves to cover a trouble ball in his or her area of responsibility. R3's retouch. 
That goes to the plate umpire. Our two's retouch in this situation stays with the second base umpire because uh, that umpire is still at second base. And as he or she moves in, uh, as U2 does, he or she is still going to be responsible then for R2's retouch okay, in that situation. But R3's retouch then goes to the plate umpire. Base is full with nobody out. U2 leaves. It's kind of the situation that I went through. So U2 leaves to cover a trouble ball in his or her area of responsibility. Remember, um, R3's retouch will go to the plate umpire because U3 has to pivot into the working area and take R2's tag up. Uh, so R2's retouch then belongs to U3. And in the last situation here, first and third, R1 on R3 and R3 with one out. Let's say U1 leaves to cover a trouble ball. U2 is going to pivot in uh, and, remember, uh, take that responsibility. So R3's retouch sticks with the third base umpire because the third base umpire is not moving in this rotation. R1's retouch then advances ahead to U2. And so it's a couple different examples there. Any questions on those examples or things that people were not unsure, uh, people unsure of here with retouches uh, or tag ups? Apologize for forgetting to bring that one up. All righty, well, that'll go ahead and wrap things up here for basic responsibilities in the three umpire, or I'm sorry, in the four umpire system. There were three different categories that we took a look at today. Number one, uh, areas of responsibility for catch, no catch with trouble and routine. Second area was fair foul coverage. And the last one, as we just mentioned, was retouch. So appreciate everybody's attention there. And again, some really good concepts to touch base with in your pregame conferences with your crews. Uh, next week, we'll be back on on Friday. That dates the 18th, 1230 p.m. Eastern is that time. We'll be on for tracking and chasing fly balls. Talk more about that concept of checking your fielder, how exactly you're supposed to run out and cover catch, no catch, and some liberty here and some uh, clarity in when exactly we're supposed to go out. So we'll revisit a lot of those concepts and then kind of introduce a few more here that we've taken a look at so far in this season. Keep building those habits. Remember, we're here at the end of the regular season, so keep working to build those habits, especially proper use of eyes and chest to ball because they'll translate into multi-member crews as we all then transition into tournament session. Uh, and obviously, as we get into tournament season, a bunch of resources that DJ dropped in the chat for you to go ahead and use, and I'll make sure that I try and link those then in the description as well on YouTube. Other than that, I appreciate everybody's time and attention as normal, uh, especially on this special air, special hour, I guess you could say, of 3 Up, 3 Down. Look forward to seeing everybody in the future, either in our replays or in our live sessions at 12.30 p.m. Eastern uh, each Friday. Everyone have a great e rest of your weekend, great evening, have a great week, and then we'll see everybody then for things on Friday. Bye, guys.